As we gather, I want to make sure that you're aware that we do have a, an accessible restroom in the side sanctuary. We also have, um, if we would have to leave this space quickly, um, you can get outside um, via either of the back exits. There's also an exit down the hallway if you know your way. But if you don't know your way as well, these back exits are probably the quickest way if you would need to leave for any reason. We want to make sure that you uh, have received a bulletin. This is our guide for our time together. It also has all of our announcements and our prayer list and different things going on in the life of the church. Um, I said it's a guide, so maybe something will be in there that won't happen, or maybe something won't be in there that will happen. Um, but we, we try to um, have it as accurate as possible. But the Spirit does what the Spirit does sometimes. So uh, we're so thankful that you're here. Um, we hope that you're happy that you're here. We're praising God that God got us up this morning and brought us on our way, brought us to the house today. Amen? Amen. 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 We want to invite you to uh, stand if you're able. We're going to sing, um, it's, I guess it's not technically a hymn, there aren't verses to it. We'll sing it a couple times through. This is um, back when we used to do calls to prayer. Um, this was one of my favorites, and it goes pretty well with the scripture for the morning. Um, as our Jesus is our gent gentle shepherd, there is none other that we can turn to who can help us face this day that is before us. So, if you're able, we invite you to stand. If you're not able, stand in spirit. And let's sing together at number 352 in your hymnal, or the words are on the screen. Gentle shepherd. Let's sing together. Even if you didn't sign up to bowl, if you want to just come hang out, 
Mount will be at the EC East on Eisenhower Boulevard between 2 and 4. I think they'll be setting up probably more on 1.30. Um, and we'd love to see as many of you come out and hang out with us as possible. We continue to do uh, meditations every week on Wednesday mornings. If you're able, please join us uh, via Zoom. We also are doing uh, adult Bible studies in the evenings at 7. And uh, Reverend Mark Pickens has uh, volunteered to kind of organize that. Uh, this week, I think Pastor Daryl Rhodes will be teaching our class. Um, and we'd love for you to show up via Zoom for our adult Bible study on Wednesday. So a lot of other things going on in the life of the church. This is the first Sunday of November, which means there is a second basket over here. And I'll talk to you more about that at offering time. But we will take a special offering for our Kid Goat Fund, which again we'll talk about later. Honor of Peace um, is continuing the Standing with People of Color program. And uh, they're having uh, gatherings on November 6th, which is tomorrow, and uh, November 18th. Uh, to get connected, to find a role to play in these organizing efforts, you can see more information about that. Our Christmas flower orders, it's hard to believe we're talking about Christmas already, but Christmas flower orders is an announcement about that. Those orders are due no later than November 28th, so that's uh, a little less than four weeks from now. Um, and we're continuing to gather bedding for uh, Refugee Bedding Drive uh, locally here. So if you have new or lightly used uh, bedding, pillowcases, pillows, um, linens, those sorts of things, um, please bring them to the church. Um, you can, they can be gathered in Pastor Lexi's office or my office or the church office. And we'll be taking all of that down to be a part of that um, bedding drive. Um, are there any other big things I need to hit, Pastor Wesley, or is that good? Stop. Okay. Um, <laughs> we're so happy to be together, church. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. And this is my favorite part of our service when we, as the priest team up here, need to watch all of you love each other and welcome each other into this space. If you're able, while we sing, we invite you to come out from where you're seated and to greet each other, to welcome everybody into the space. Um, thank you, Nelson, for bringing the percussion instruments around. Um, we could, will appreciate all of your help um, in keeping the beat as we sing together. And now I'm going to Sister Natasha to lead us in worship. Praise the Lord, church. Praise the Lord, church. Hallelujah.
thank you for this day. We thank you for the rising of the sun and for the setting down of the sun. We thank you, God, because you have been so good to us. We thank you, Lord, because you have been so great to us. We thank you, God, because you are King of kings and you are Lord of lords and you are worthy to be praised. We praise you, O oh God, in season and out of season, God. We thank you, Lord Jesus, O oh God. We thank you, God, for the activities of our lands. We thank you, O oh God, for siblings to worship with, O oh God. We thank you, O oh God, for a place of worship, O oh God. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for community. We thank you, O oh God, for answering our prayers. We thank you, O oh God, for meeting us, O oh God, where we are in need, O oh God. We thank you, O oh God, for meeting us where we are in the name of Jesus. We thank you, God, for sending your Holy Spirit to comfort us, O oh God. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy, O oh God. We thank you, Lord Jesus, O oh God, because your word tells us in all things to give you thanks, O oh God. We thank you, O oh God, even in that day, O oh God. We thank you, O oh God, for the bowling tonight, O oh God. We thank you, O oh God, for just this activity to come together and just to have fun. Yes, Lord. We thank you, O oh God, for those, O oh God, who are not here, who desire to be here. We pray, O oh God, for those who are sick and afflicted, O oh God. We pray, O oh God, that you will send them peace, O oh God, yes, and healing in the name of Jesus. We thank you, O oh God, for those who are traveling and carrying, O oh God. We pray, O oh God, that you will grant them safe passage, O oh God, as they go to and fro in the name of Jesus. We thank you, O oh God, for the week, O oh God, that is ahead, O oh God. We thank you, O oh God, for everything that we are about to meet, O oh God. Because we send Judah first in the name of Jesus, O oh God. And we believe for the report, O oh God, of the victor, O oh God. Yeah. That you, O oh God, will give us the strength, O oh God, to withstand all yeah. things, O oh God. That you will continue, O oh God, to put a hedge of protection around us, your people, O oh God. And that you will send us angels, O oh God, that will guard and watch over us in the name of Jesus. Amen. We thank you, O oh God, for this service, O oh God. We thank you for the word, O oh God, that you have prepared, O oh God, for Pastor Lexi, O oh God, to share with us, O oh God. We thank you in that O oh God, and we receive it in the name of Jesus. We thank you, O oh God, for the communion time, O oh God, that we are going to, O oh God, do in reverence, O oh God, for you, your body that was broken and your blood, O oh God, that was slain, O oh God. For us, O oh God, you died, O oh God, that we might live, O oh God, and live again. We thank you. For these things, O oh God, we thank you. If we had, oh God, 10,000 tongues, oh God, it just still wouldn't be enough to say, thank you. Thank you. Because you continue to be good to us, oh God, even when we don't deserve it, oh God. Even, oh God, when we don't live a life that's pleasing, oh God. Even, oh God, when we don't give you, oh God, what you deserve. We, you, God, you're just so good to us. And so we thank you, God. We thank you, God, because you don't forget about us. We thank you, God, because even though, God, when we forget to get up in the morning and say thank you, to give your name praise, to pray before we go to bed, oh, God, to say thank you when we're out and about, you don't forget about us. So we thank you, God. We thank you, Lord Jesus. And we pray, God, that whatever, oh, God, we forgot to thank you for, oh, God, that you will see it, oh, God, and charge it to our head and not our hearts in the name of Jesus, oh, God. Because we love you, Lord. And we thank you. And for these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
For some of us, it's easy to recognize your goodness because things are going well. And for some of us, it's, it's kind of difficult. Even getting up today might have been hard. And regardless of where you find us today, Lord, we recognize your goodness. We recognize your faithfulness that, that you continue to just be there. Your word doesn't promise that life's going to be easy. It doesn't promise that we uh, will not endure storms. In fact, living our lives for you ensures that we will endure storms, Lord. But what your word does promise is that you'll be with us amongst the what your word does promise is that you'll give us each other so that we can weather that storm together, oh God. And we just thank you for your still small voice amidst that storm, guiding us through, helping us to recognize we can make it, helping us to, to persevere, to hold on a little longer. For us to recognize that as we effort for your kingdom, you're truly blessed. Even though we might not be blessed by this world's standards. We might endure all kinds of persecution, all kinds of difficulty. We might endure the failure of our, our earthly bodies. We'll certainly endure all sorts of opposition as we strive after you, bring your kingdom here and now. We just thank you, God, for helping us to endure, for helping us to pull one foot in front of another, for guiding us, for giving us each other to help in this journey, Lord God. We thank you. God, amidst all of that, amidst all that's going on, we do recognize your goodness and we acknowledge it, Lord. We recognize the times when we just weren't able to dwell in your midst. We recognize the times when we went our own way when you had to chase after us, Lord. And regardless of, of any of that, you remain good. And we just thank you and acknowledge you today. We love you. We thank you for all these things and many other things unsaid. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise the Lord, church. Um, in the house today, we have several answers to prayer. Um, some of you know we we're praying for Brother Rick um, as he had eye surgery this week. Um, thank you guys for praying for uh, my wisdom teeth removal and stuff. I can talk, so that's good. Um, praise God for that. Um, there are others in our midst that we need to remain praying for. We need to pray for Pastor Belita in the church. Um, she's going through some difficult health issues right now. Um, we're asking for no phone calls, but please do pray. If you feel like to send a card, let everyone you're thinking of her, please do that. Um, we received word this week that uh, Brother Mark Wolf uh, went back to the hospital from his rehab assignment with pneumonia, and he's on today, so... Um, just keep him in your thoughts and in your prayers, too. This has been a long slog. I think it was June when he first went in, so it's been a long time. We're thankful that he's still with us. Um, it's a miracle that he's alive, so we're praising God for that. Um, but we're just praying that each day gets a little better than the day before. So just keep Brother Mark in your prayers. As you look at your bulletin, you might have noticed there's like seven birthdays this week, and there's more coming in the, the month of November, too. So we're praising God for a new year for all these different people. Um, let's see. Let's just look. Io is in the house today. It's his birthday coming up tomorrow. Chuck is... Uh, Chuck's... Oh, I didn't see him. Hey, Chuck. Chuck's birthday is this week, too. Praise God. Sandy, who's on Zoom with Brother Mark. His birthday is this week. Brother Layton, I think, is our oldest living member. Um, has a birthday this week as well. Alyssa Andre, Corey, Alyssa Parker. So many birthdays. This just this week, and we're praising God for that. Um, why don't we sing happy birthday to all of the birthdays in November? We'll do it probably next week too, because there'll be like ten more next week and, and so on and so forth. But why don't we sing happy birthday? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. I alluded in the announcements this morning that 
Uh, we have an opportunity to give, in addition to our regular tithes and offerings, which we'll give in the big basket, we can give a little extra in the, to the Kingdom Fund. For those of you that don't know what that is, the Kingdom Fund gives us a very um, concrete way of being there for each other. Recently, we helped a family um, who was behind in their rent um, because they were out of work and now they're back to work. So we were able to kind of bridge the gap. A couple months back, we were able to help another family that was having car trouble to uh, kind of fix that issue. And now we're asking this week if you feel led to support a family that's forced to relocate um, or trying to help um, alleviate some of the burden of the, the security deposit. They, they have everything lined up, and once they're in, they'll be able to pay every month, but we're just trying to help them get in there. Um, so uh, we want to uh, make that specific ask um, for you today. And if you want to get towards that, um, that's the smaller basket to the side. All right? I do want to also say, we've been saying this for several weeks, um, but if you did not receive a commitment card in the mail, um, there should be some at the table, and if you don't see one at the table, you did not get one at your house, please see Pastor Lexi or myself to get one in your hands. And this is just your commitment for the coming year, how you might give of your time, your talent, and your finances in the coming year to support God's church right here on Hall Street. Um, we use that information to try to figure out how to fill different roles in the church and also um, how to um, plan how we're going to use the finances in the coming year um, for, for God's kingdom here um, on Hummel Street. So um, if you have not received one of those, you can find one at the table. If there's not one there, see Lexi or myself around that. Let's pray, um, and then we'll invite the, the ushers to come and bring the table. Lord God, we thank you for this another opportunity praise you, to recognize your goodness, to give you a portion of all you bless us with, Lord. We pray that these gifts, the financial ones, the gifts of our time, the gifts of our talent, we pray that all that will be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, Lord. That you'll use all of who we are, all of who this body is, to further your kingdom, to bring your kingdom right here. That your kingdom will come, that your will will be done right here on our as it is in heaven. Lord, do what only you can do in these holy moments as we praise you with our giving. We love you and thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 The ushers can come and bring the table over. The priest will continue to lead us in worship. And as you feel led, please feel free to come and bring your gifts before the Lord today.
siblings that uh, desire to live their lives for you. Uh, we dedicate them to you this day and thank you for them in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You guys can go to your class with Alyssa and Julie and Renee. Go ahead. Scripture for today can be found in the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 9 and 13, and we're reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. This is Paul writing to the church in Thessalonica. And what an answer you. All right. Glad I saw him before I started. Praise the Lord, church. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. You remember our labor and toil, brothers and sisters. We worked night and day so that you might not burden any of you. We might not burden any of you. While we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how pure, upright, and blameless our conduct was toward you believers. As you know, we dealt with each one of you like a father with his children, urging and encouraging you and pleading that you lead a life worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. We also consistently give thanks to God for this, that when you received the word of God that you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as what it really is, God's word, which is also at work in you believers. Amen. Praise the Lord, Church. This time we invite Pastor Lexi to bring the word. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 See, sometimes 
we have a problem. Sometimes we say that we'll get an idea, we want to do something, we'll get pretty close, right? We'll get all the supplies, we'll have the plan, and then we get tired. And then we just push it off, right? We say, oh, okay, well, next week, next week I'll tackle the pain, you know? I just, I just need one more week of rest. I had a really long, long day at work, you know, yesterday. And I just, not, not this week. Maybe sometimes we realize that we got a new faucet for our kitchen and that we have no idea how to install this new faucet. So then we're like, well, maybe we need a friend to help us. And then your friend's always busy and then you don't want to go on YouTube to figure out how to install it. And so you decide, well, I'll just wait and wait and wait until, you know, someone's actually available. All right? So regardless though, once all of the excitement around these new paint color spades, once the high of buying everything has disappeared, when we are left with the actual work of having to paint, of having to um, install, of having to come together and put something new in, we stop. So, some of you are probably sitting out there in your chairs and your pews and you're feeling, oh my goodness, Pastor Lexi, you really called me out on that one. And to that I would say I'm sorry. Another of you might be thinking, well, Pastor Lexi, what does an unfinished home improvement project have to do with Paul's letter to the Thessalonians? And then I would tell you, this is why you have to pay attention to the sermon so I can give you the answer. Okay, so, here we are. We are in the epistle to the Thessalonians. Paul wrote this letter to them during a time of persecution, a time of hardship, and a time of absent leadership. See, Paul himself was forced to leave in the same way that he was forced to leave Philippi. There is great persecution for this new community of believers in Thessalonica. We know this if we go into Acts chapter 17. There in Acts 17 verses 1 through 6, it tells us a little bit about what this persecution would have looked like. We hear that when Paul arrives in Thessalonica, he does what is customary, and that is he causes some trouble. He goes straight to the synagogue, right? He doesn't go into the homes, he doesn't sit on the outskirts of town, he goes right into the middle of it all, he goes right to the synagogue, and he starts to have some conversations, some conversations that lead to arguing with all the religious leaders about scripture. And Paul consistently tells them over and over again that the scriptures are telling that Jesus is the Messiah and that what Jesus did fulfilled the scriptures so that they all need to think differently, live differently, because Jesus the Messiah has come and he has left these new teachings for them. And as Paul has these arguments with the religious leaders over these scriptures, it also tells them there's a group of Jews, of God-fearing Greeks, and they even use the phrase, a few prominent women who decided to form a new community of believers together. Yet upon this choice to form community, there were other people in the community, especially uh, some different Jews, who were jealous, jealous of what was going on. And so they sought to punish Paul. And after attempting to find Paul, in verse 6 of Acts 17, it tells us that the believer Jason was dragged before the officials because he was accused of hiding Paul. And they said, men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. Oh my goodness. What a compliment. Paul and his friend Silas are there and they're known as troublemakers. Another translation of that Greek wording um, is not just cause trouble, but to turn the world upside down. Paul and Silas were known to be the people who are coming to turn your world upside down. Upside down. And so out of fear and out of confusion, there was persecution for Paul and those who chose to follow Paul in this new way of believing, in this new way of being that was known as being a Christ follower. So this is what their persecution looked like. And it made life difficult, right? And when you think about it, to be a Christian is already pretty difficult, right? All the different teachings that Christ has given us, right? All the things that we've heard of him doing in the gospel texts, those are hard things to live out. And then, when you think about this community that is forming, a community of Jews, of God-fearing Greeks, 
and even a few prominent women. This has got to be hard, right? What could a Jew and a Greek and a woman all have in common, right? So not only are Jesus' teachings hard, just those by himself, not only is living in community with someone who is different than you are, but then you have people on the outside who want to come in and punish you for simply believing and choosing to be different. By choosing to be a troublemaker, by choosing to follow Paul who is here to preach the gospel of turning the world upside down. This was the reality for the community in Thessalonica. Not only did Paul understand what they were going through, for he too had been persecuted for his beliefs, but he also felt a little bit of guilt, I think, because he was unable to be with them to lead this community because of persecution. When I was reading through some of the commentaries of this text, one of the characterizations of this community of believers in Thessalonica that I found rather apt for our current context was the description of a community of absent leadership. Paul had fled Thessalonica again in the same way that he was forced to leave Philippi. And so this person who was responsible for gathering up this community of believers, who was responsible for causing all of this trouble, who was responsible for getting people together to follow Christ, he got them all together and then had to leave. This reminds me of some of the group projects that I would do at school or sometimes maybe you guys had to do team projects at work. Right, you get all these people together, and there's one person on your team who's really energized to be there. Like they are so happy to meet with you. Right? The first one or two meetings, they are great. They are there early. They have lots of ideas. Somehow they naturally become the leader of the group, right? And you start making this plan. And this, this plan is heavily inspired by the one person that has all this energy. But then when it comes to third meeting, where you actually have to do the plan, where you have to sit down and research together, you have to sit down and write a paper or collect the data, that person seems to be non-existent. Right? They disappear. They leave. They start out being five minutes late, ten minutes late. Right? All of a sudden, they're just gone. Right? All of that excitement and energy they had at the beginning is vanished. And I think that the community in Thessalonica was experiencing some of that hardship. The person who was there with energy and excitement to tell them about this gospel, this new way of being, who had been the reason why they formed in the first place, had to leave the moment they had to start doing the real work. In the same way that we may get excited about starting a home improvement project, right after all the ideas have been laid out and the plans have been formed, even when we have all of the supplies, when we finally get to the step that requires us to do, we lose all of our momentum. We lose all of our steam. <clears throat> See, I told you, the first part, it would come back around if you're paying attention. So knowing this is the situation that the South Thessalonians found themselves in, Paul writes them a letter to encourage them. Encourage them to press on. So that's where we find ourselves today. Paul reminds the Thessalonians that they were cared for and nurtured by Paul and Silas. So there's two verses that I probably should have included um, in the reading as well, but I'll kind of give you the gist of them. So in verse 7, actually, which you didn't hear, but Paul tells them, he writes that just as nursing mothers care for her children, so too did Paul care for the Thessalonians. So this is the first piece of encouragement that Paul reminds them. Not only would the image of a caring mother bring comfort to the believers, right, in the same way we might imagine our mothers caring for us, but for those of you who are parents, you know that once you have a child, that that child is your child forever. Even when they grow up, even when they get their own homes, their own lives, and even when they have children of their own, your child will always be your child. You will always care for them as your child. And so this image of a nursing mother, again, brought comfort, not just in the moment, but because it reminded the Thessalonians that they were not going to be just cared for at the beginning, 
but that Paul was going to continue to care for them just as they grew and matured in the same way that a mother cares for her child at the beginning and in the middle and up until she can't. So Paul also offered this encouragement, but he also told them a couple other things to encourage them. He told them that not only would he care for them, but that he loved them. And in verse 8, Paul says, And it's because we love you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. In this sense, Paul is saying that not only did we tell you about the good news, but we chose to live out the good news with you. If I were an early listener to this letter, there's a couple things that would come to mind. When Paul would write this to me, I would remember the countless meals that I shared with Paul. I'd probably also remember how someone offered him robes when he first arrived into our community. I might have been present when someone offered to wash his feet. And I'd probably remember how without hesitation, there was someone there to <coughs> offer him a place to stay for that first night after all of his long travels so that he could get some And then after thinking about that, I would hear Paul's encouragement again. And I would remember how as an early believer, I might have been cared for when I first joined this community of Jews and Gentiles and a few prominent women. I would remember that the first night I was with them, my stomach was not empty. That for the first time, I would go to bed without knowing how I would remember in the same way that Paul was able to find rest after his long travels, that I found rest with a community of people who accepted me for who I was, regardless of identity and possessions. And they accepted me strictly because, and only because, I came to them as a firm believer in Jesus. How wonderful, how wonderful it would have been to remember this. How encouraged would I have felt after hearing those words from Paul? After remembering the things that happened to Paul, the things that had happened to me, and the ways that Paul was cared for, and the ways that I was cared for, how wonderful it would have been to remember this. And Paul knew that. Paul knew that would happen when he wrote this. And that's why he did it. Because Paul knew that the church in Thessalonica was full of committed folk and that God was doing something wonderful with them. God was doing something wonderful through them. Paul knew that their existence as a community of believers was important. Paul wanted them to carry on living out their faith together. And so that's why Paul tells them that they must encourage and urge and plead with one another to live lives worthy of God. <clears throat> when I read this story in the context of our community of believers here on Hummel Street, I wouldn't say that our problem is necessarily the doing piece. I think that here at First Church, we sometimes are the Thessalonians. We have been energized for many years. We've been excited about doing things. Right? And it's wonderful to see that we are a congregation that does. My office right now currently is full of bedding for all the different refugees that are coming to Harrisburg and are looking for places to stay. And it is extraordinary to see our ability to rally together to offer support for those who we do not know that are coming to be with us in the city. And I think about today, how we collect an extra offering for our kingdom fund, because we know that that is a tangible and concrete way that we can care for one another. So when I think about reading this story, through the, listen to the ears of a Harrisburg First member, I don't think that we have a problem to do it. And I don't think that we have a problem about 
committing to care to serve one another. Right? I think that's something that we're really good at. It's part of why, why we're brother, that's why we're here. But I do think that we struggle with doing some of the other pieces of hard work. Sometimes I think that we struggle with doing the organizing, with doing the commitment to tasks that we don't want to do right now. So here at First Church, we have lots of amazing programs, right? We continue to offer services through BCM Peace in the ways of our food and our wellness hub. Uh, our free store is just um, growing exponentially, the number of people that are volunteering and going through it. And, um, every week, goods are coming in and things are leaving. And I know that God is doing something amazing through those things. And I also know that God has provided us with a myriad of other resources, of other giftings and people and talents here at this church. Yet I think what we're struggling with here is this idea of absent leadership in the way that the Thessalonians were also dealing with it. That's not to say you guys don't have two pastors, because you do. There's some leadership here, right? And it's not to say that we don't have people who have demonstrate leadership skills and we have leaders on teams. But I do think that we amongst ourselves are missing the energy that comes when we have people who are energized at the beginning of the project, and who continue to be energized through the project. And so this morning, together, we need to find a way to encourage and to urge and to plead one another into not only doing programs and doing service, but of doing the hard work of being together, of discerning a shared vision of what God's kingdom and glory looks like here and now. So what does this really look like for us? So at the end of the reading, again, Paul reminds them that they should be encouraged, that they should urge one another and plead with one another to pursue lives that are worthy of God's glory. And so I'm going to take those three pieces today for us to think about. So the first one that I'm going to tackle is urging. What does urging look like in our community? And this is something that I think some of us are good at, and some of us might need some help with. But this is the incessant call that you get from someone here to ask you where you've been, right? It's the incessant call to come and join us for a meeting or for a program activity. It's the times that we come up here and we always announce what's going on for you to be involved in. It's a conversation that you're inevitably going to have with somebody before you leave to ask you what you can, how they can be um, in your life this week in prayer or how you can do something with them. It's the ask to be a part of service, to be a part of a program, or to be a part of a team. And that ask is also an invitation right, to do life together. That's what the urge is. We urge you to be a part of what we're doing. And we urge you because we think God's doing something cool here. And if you say yes, great. And we're also going to then encourage you. Right, once we've urged you to be a part of what we're doing here, we want to work on encouraging one another. Right? So it's not just the first call that you get. Right? It's making sure that you call someone after they've said yes. Right? Checking up with them after they've decided to be a part of what's going on here. And the encouragement is important because it's a reminder to all of us, members, regular attendees, friends of the church and neighbors, that we are all needed for the work that God is calling us to do. Right? Your presence, my presence, your ideas, our ideas, your giftings, their giftings, your talents, our talents, our time and resources, our beings, they are all necessary for the work that God has called us to be. Right? Without you, we will continue to be an unfinished home improvement project. 
Without all of us, we will simply just stop doing the work. Right now, sometimes it feels as if we are all a beautiful myriad of different supplies that are hanging out in the garage, right? I know amongst us that we have painters. I know amongst us that there's the screwdrivers and the rollers and the tape, right? There's even a couple of hands out in the midst. But sometimes it feels as if we're just in the garage, a little unorganized, unmobilized, unenergized. I don't know if those are words, but those are the ones that made me think of. Sometimes it feel, right, that God's calling us to do something, but we haven't figured out how to do it together. Because I know, in the same way that Paul knew the church in Thessalonica was important, that our kingdom here on Humble Street is important. Right? I see it in the way it's manifested in everyone's lives here today. Right? Everyone here in our, in our pews and our chairs has a testament as to why God has brought them here into this church. And everyone has a testament of how this church has been encouragement and support for them in their lives. And there are those outside of these walls today who have the same story about what we have done here with them and for them and with, with them again. So I know the work here is important. But I also know that we need to figure out a way to how to organize it for all of us to be a part of it. For not just to be our separate tools and supplies in the garage, but to come together and actually build and do the work. Now we're getting into the last part. You've already got a taste of it. The last part is pleading. I'm coming before you this morning to offer some pleading. I am pleading with all of you that you listen to these words. I am pleading with all of you that you figure out Pray and discern the giftings that you have and that you stay and remain a part of what God is doing here. The pleading part is one that's a little bit challenging. And it's challenging because it also requires us two things. It requires two things of us. One, it requires this confrontation. Right? I have to acknowledge that we have a problem here. We have to acknowledge that we have a problem here. We have to be able and willing to confront the problem. And we also then have to be willing and able to be vulnerable. We have to say that we need help, and we have to, have to say that we need each other. Sometimes the pleading is going to be having a conversation with a friend about a topic that you know that they don't agree on. Sometimes the pleading will be confronting someone not just on a hard topic, but on a hard decision. And sometimes the pleading is crying out of love in front of another person because you know that you're better with them than without them. We have to plead with one another confront and be vulnerable with one another that we need each other to do the work that God has called us to do. We have to plead. We have to encourage and we have to urge that we all remain here doing the thing that God is asking us to do. In the Women's Bible Commentary, scholar biblical studies professor Dr. Moya Stubbs writes that Paul taught the community of Thessalonica to not only share the gospel, but also to share the emotional joys and pains of communal life. She also says that Paul taught them that they work not to burden the community, but rather to contribute in those daily activities that provide the basic necessities of life. They work not to burden the community, but rather to contribute in those daily activities that provide the basic necessities of life. That part really stood out to me. And it reminds me of what Paul wrote to them in verse 8, right? When he said, let me find it. Or it's the one where he says, um, 
that not only did we did we share the gospel with you, but we shared our lives with you, right? They not they work not to burden the community, but rather to contribute in those daily activities that provide the basic necessities of life. Sometimes I think the doing that we do here ends up becoming a burden to others, right? Sometimes the things that we are asking here end up being burdens to others. And we're starting to lose sight of what the daily activities are. But we need to focus on making sure that all of us have the basic necessities of life. That is what we're being called to. Nothing more and nothing less. So this morning, church, I have some questions, some things for you to ponder. I want us to figure out with one another how can we orient ourselves and orient our church to be with one another through the emotional joys and the pains of life? And I know that we are good at that at moments, right? I'm so grateful for the ways that everyone is so eager to share during joys and concerns. I'm grateful for the times that I get text messages about things that are going on in y'all's life. Know that I celebrate all of those joys and I pray with you for all of your concerns. And I know that it's not just me. Right? I know that our deacons do the same thing. I know that other members do that. So I know. I know that we are a church that wants to do that. To be there for one another through those emotional joys and the pains of life. But the next thing I want us to figure out how to do is how can we ensure that the things that we require of one another, the things that we require of one another as members of this congregation, as a church, do not burden the lives of others, but rather provides the basic necessities of life, right? How can we be a church where everyone is involved, everyone is accountable, but the things that we are asking do not burden, but rather lead to someone having the basic necessities of their life taken care of, right? And I'm leaving you with that thought because I don't have an answer to it. <laughs> I know I never give you answers and I will continue to say I'm sorry about that. But it's something that I want us to figure out how to do, right? Church should be a place that is life-giving. And I'm not just talking on Sunday mornings. I'm talking about Tuesday nights when we have meetings. I'm talking about Wednesdays during Bible study. I'm talking about Friday mornings when we have food, right? Everything that we do as church, everything, our worship, our programming, and even our business, needs to be life-giving. It needs to be able to contribute to the basic necessities of life without being a burden. So how can we organize ourselves in a way that that is where our focus is? And that's the project that we aim to complete. Not the other projects that we think God is asking us to do. Right? Or the things that we've been doing that we think we need to keep doing. This morning, church, if preach to you a word, and I hope that in some pieces of it, you have been encouraged. I hope some pieces of it, that you've been urged. But I hope that you hear me as I plead with you. That I want you here. And I want you to live a life together. One that is worthy of God's glory. And one that seeks to be of God's kingdom. Not our kingdom, not the world's kingdom, but God's kingdom here and now. And so I hope that these words not only offer you encouragement, not only urge you, and not only do you hear my plea, but I hope that it sparks within you some desire to reorganize, to re-energize, and reimagine how we are supposed how we are supposed to be siblings in Christ to one another so that together we can be a part of God's work that is happening within all of God's believers. Amen. So as the praise team is coming up, um, I'll just say that we're going to have our reflection song before communion. Um, but I am going to ask them the reflection piece to... So hopefully consider some of the things that have been shared. Um, and they'll hear the things that have been spoken. Um, 
to see what it is that God is giving you to contribute um, to what God is doing here in this space. And as you do that also, um, I do encourage you to uh, take some time to prepare your hearts also for communion, um, to be able to take some time to think about what it means to not only be church, um, but to continue um, to be Christ following your own journey with God through communion. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, Church. Praise the Lord. I want to invite you to uh, stand at this time. We're going to just acknowledge how far God has brought us Amen. and uh, the means for energizing us um, to respond to the plea that has gone forth. So let's sing together, and then we'll, we will transition to a time of reflection.
Um, and I think deacons are going to be bringing the cart out. And um, as you, you guys can have a seat, I think. Um, we're going to have a, a time to just reflect on what has been shared with us, um, to reflect on um, all that Jesus has done um, in each of our lives that has brought us to this place. All that Jesus has done in this body that has brought us to this place. And uh, God invites us to the Holy Table today. And so let's just reflect upon, um, again, what the pastor has brought forth this morning. Let's reflect on all that Christ has already done. And then all that Christ might be stirring up in us as we uh, approach the Holy Table. The praise team is going to sing a, a song called In Christ Alone. You can sing with us or just... Get with God in your space, right where you are, um, and just reflect upon all of these things. Amen? Amen. Amen. To, to, to God's will, to what God has in store for us. 
voice. And we just want to hear that call, hear that, that plea and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And amen. Lord, call us back to where you want us to be. Help us to say yes to what you're calling us to this day. Lord, as you invite us to your home table, let us just experience the blessing of what it is to commune with you and to commune with each other. Just pray for these holy moments, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. We read the scripture that Jesus shared his last meal with his disciples and after the meal, he took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Whenever you break it, whenever you take it, do so in remembrance of me. He took a cup and he blessed it and he said, this is the new covenant my blood is shed for you. Whenever you take this cup, do so in remembrance of me. We want to invite you as, as you feel led to come and, and to take the cup, to take the bread and then to return to your seats and then we'll um, share the whole community together and our deacons will um, dispense of the, the elements as you come. If you're unable to come, they'll bring some to you as well. So as we need a place, feel free to please come and get the elements.
This bread is Jesus' body broken for each one of us. And uh, we are truly blessed to commune with God and to commune with one another as we take it. You can see the affirmation in Spanish and in English. Uh, feel free to use whichever language you feel comfortable using as we say the affirmation together. The spread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. Please take it.